Kevin asked me to do some narration, but he did not ask me to sing. There's a reason for that. It's all about the tree. And the tree is all about you. Don't miss out on what it's all about. A few days ago, Brenda and I were going into Lowe's. There were some Christmas trees on display outside the main entrance, and they were so pretty and so full and so perfect, they looked almost artificial. And I said as I reached out to touch one, are these real? And Brenda's reply was, well, they don't usually sit the artificial ones in a bucket of water. <laughs> Smart aleck. That's why I don't take her to Lowe's very often. The tree, Calvary's tree, was real. And the love that was displayed there is real. Peter wrote the words we shared in message number one of the series. And he himself, Jesus Christ, bore our sins in his body upon the cross that we might die to sin and live to righteousness for by his wounds you were healed in this second message of our series we consider the the good news tree if you will in our world and i would include all of us in that generalization we are looking for some good news amen Inflation, a world torn by wars and discord, COVID in all of its variant forms, news that daily staggers the imagination of even the most calloused of people, school shootings, on the street shootings, drive-by shootings, and on a more local in our valley backyard, Headlines, homelessness, broken homes and families, abused children, on and on and on the list goes of not so good news. We need some good news. Yet, we are sometimes so very busy doing stuff, even good stuff, even Christmas stuff, that we of all people, believers, fail to hear and celebrate the good news that we already know. Jeff Stadler in one of his editorial cartoons showed a, a husband and wife in front of their real tree decorating gifts and on her list of things yet to do as it was laying before her, she said Christmas would be such a wonderful time of the year if I just had time to enjoy it. One lady confided to her sister after she had taken a trip to the mall and seen all the busyness of the world and as it was on display, and it's still crazy out there even though we have so much online shopping that we do. She said to her sister, the only verse of the Christmas story that I can relate to is they came with haste. <laughs> it is, there is such a Christmas rush. Can you believe there are only... 14 more days left to buy Pastor Bob a present. <laughs> 14 days. Folks, don't let that one little verse they came with haste describe you at Christmas time. Rather, the good news there has been born to you a Savior. Our primary text this morning is a portion of what we are most familiar with from Luke's Gospel beginning at verse 8 of chapter 2. And there were in the same country shepherds abiding in a field, keeping watch over their flocks by night. And lo, the angel of the Lord came upon them, and the glory of the Lord shone round about them, and they were sore afraid. 
And the angel said unto them, Fear not, for behold, I bring you good tidings of great joy, which shall be to all people. For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior, who is Christ the Lord. And this shall be a sign unto you. You shall find the babe wrapped in swaddling clothes, lying in a manger. And suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of the heavenly host, praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace, goodwill toward men. While that is indeed the Christmas story, the whole story starts on page 1, chapter 1, verse 1. In the beginning, God. Because God created and God loved and God gave his creation, you and me, a choice. And with actually a short time, mankind made the wrong choice. Turned from God to disobey him, to sin. But God loved his creation and provided for his creation this plan. A plan for reconciliation, a plan for restoration, a plan for redemption. And in Luke's rendering of that story, we see that plan fleshed out in Jesus Christ. Paul wrote in Galatians 4, when the fullness of time was come, God sent forth his son. Translation, when just the right moment in history came, God sent Jesus to be your Savior. Christmas tells us that, that on a specific time, just the right time, at a specific place, Bethlehem of Judea, a specific person, Jesus Christ, God in the flesh, was born. And that is still good news. Amen. On that night, verse 9 tells us the angel announced, and a couple verses later, the angels declared. Now, this, this was not your typical Sunday morning announcement time. This week in so-and-so's house, the sweet little ladies group will meet to knit and share prayer concerns. And on Tuesday morning, the men will meet for breakfast to discuss Monday night football and read the scripture verse just to make it right. I'll digest to a degree. But no, this was the announcement of all announcements. A Savior is born. Oh yes, there had been some, some pre-announcements hundreds of years before. Isaiah and Micah had said, it's going to happen. It's going to happen. It's going to happen. But on this night, God would invade history in a very unique way incarnation he would come to live among mankind the creation of his design to show to give to manifest to make known his love in a real way oh what an announcement and that's why i have probably struggled through the years of my ministry with my pastoral duty and that is to give pastoral infomercials on sunday morning there's nothing that I could announce that would not pale in comparison to the good news of Jesus Christ. The words of the angel, to you, a Savior, glory. In verse 13 and 14 of that chapter, the angels, a multitude of the heavenly host, declared. One year, some time ago, I, I said in a Sunday morning message, and we have some friends here this morning from uh, our previous church, Robert and Ed Sweeney, grateful to have them. They may remember this. I said in the Sunday morning message before Christmas that the angels sang. And someone, dear lady in our church, now in glory, I think, she took me to task on that statement. And I can still hear her voice. Pastor Bob, it doesn't say the angels sang. Okay. But, but try to get your head around this, if you would. Can you imagine? Can you imagine angels 
with the greatest news ever delivered? Well, glory. Glory to God in the highest and on earth. Peace, goodwill to men. Well, forgive me if you must, but I think the angels declared. I think they were enthusiastic. I think they could not but sing the greatest announcement of all time. There is a Savior born. Glory to God in the highest. And it's a song that we need to sing with enthusiasm. Those present that night for the announcements, the shepherds, as the choir has shared with us, they were a captive and, and captivated audience, if you will. The angels said, do not be afraid. Oh, yeah. They were scared out of their wits. They were disturbed. They didn't know what was going on, confused. But they listened. They listened. Did they understand? Did they fully understand? I heard one man say recently, my wife expects me to understand every word she isn't saying. Personally, I have some problem understanding what I do here, what is being said. But I'm sure on this night, these men did not fully comprehend the message, the full intent of the message. But by their response, they did Listen, these shepherds were, in a sense, a, a microcosm of our world today, a world needing hope and joy. These men, because of their vocation, shepherds were, were generally despised by the good, orthodox, pious people of the day. Out in the fields, dirty, they could not be very religious, at least according to the relative terms of religiosity. The details of ceremonial law, hand washing, rules, regulation. They smelled. They had dirt under their nails. They couldn't make church ever Saturday. They needed some good news. News of acceptance and grace and love and forgiveness and salvation. A Savior. Good news. Came to a bunch of ragtag shepherds who lived out in Sun Lakes, Arizona. I love the shepherd's response. After the angels sang the, the invitation hymn, they didn't even have to get to the, to the second verse. It was a unanimous decision in verse 15. The shepherds said one to another, let us go now. A recording of the first committee that ever fully agreed on anything. But they came with haste scripture says and they found they found their lamb the lamb of god which had been delivered by a virgin good news to the world if you back up a little bit in the story and she brought forth her firstborn son and wrapped him in swaddling clothes and laid him in a manger because there was no room for them in the end. Rachel, Rachel Ellison picked up her grandson from their church's preschool on the last day before the Christmas holidays. And it was obvious that they had been discussing the Christmas story. Little Jackson said, Grandma, I don't understand why Mary and Joseph didn't come to Kansas. We have lots of motels here, and there would have been a place for him to stay. <laughs> Bethlehem, Kansas, Arizona, Texas, New York, we all have lots of motels. But there's so much rejection of the one who came as our Savior. You follow his life in the 33 years from his birth, and you see there was a general rejection of Jesus. But there were those who made heart room for him, who invited him into their life. And I ask you this morning, have you made 
heart room for Jesus. If you read these verses carefully, earlier in the chapter, verse 10, 11, 12, the emphasis is on the personal pronoun four times. I bring you good news, born to you, a sign for you, you will find. There is no greater news than Jesus Christ came for you. I love the little story of a mom who cleverly expressed her holiday exhaustion in their family Christmas card. On the front, he had a picture of their four children and the phrase, I love to give homemade gifts for Christmas. And inside it read, which one of our kids would you like? (laughs) God had one son his only begotten son, Jesus Christ, and he gave that son for you. We read in part last week some verses out of Philippians 2. His son, Jesus Christ, who, though he was God, did not think equality with God to be something held on to, cling to. Instead, he gave up his divine privileges. He took an humble position of a slave, and was born as a human being. When he appeared in human form, he humbled himself in obedience to God and died a criminal's death upon the cross. That's what he did for you, for me. Do you ever really pause and consider what he gave up and what he gave? God gave his son who gave up heaven's glory to reside among men. And then gave up his life on Calvary's cross. So I asked this morning, what are you giving up so that others might know the good news of Christmas? What are you giving up? What's your response to what he has done for you? What are you giving up so that others might know Christ at Christmas? We feel a little more charitable at, at Christmas time. And while we spend lots on family and give lots of gifts, we'll drop a little change in the red bucket outside some store, or we'll drop a little change in our mission offering here at church. We might even feel led to do something for a family in need or, or buy some extra gifts to drop off at Toys for Tots or some such agency. But our giving in reality is not very super sacrificial, is it? It might make us feel warm and fuzzy, but should not our hearts be broken for a world that does not know the Jesus that we know? We should give until it hurts because he gave his all and it hurt. USA Today reports and projects that even in a time of unsettled economy when we're all fearful of what's next year might bring, we spent $9.1 billion on Black Friday. And we spent over $11 billion on Cyber Monday. And they project that during the Christmas season in America, we will spend $850 billion. A few billion one way or the other. Does it matter a lot? Because that's still a lot. Yet it does not begin to compare with what he gave. So may I challenge you this Christmas, not just to give your change or not just to give your bills, rather to give Jesus to someone at Christmas time. Now some will always say or they'll think, Well, just a baby, 
What can a baby do? I remember the story, and of course you know that uh, some give Mary, the mother of Jesus, a more prominence than perhaps we do. They give her a pronounced distinction and, and a higher place than, than we do. But I remember one old skeptic who met the local priest and asked him, trying to snare him, Tell me, Father, what's the difference between Christ's mother and my mother? The old priest replied, Sir, that I don't know, but there's a great, great difference between the two sons. That son... God's one and only Son came to be among us. Emmanuel, God with us in the flesh. And that was and is good news. Not only good news to hear, but good news to share. He only had one line in the annual Christmas pageant. Behold, I bring you good tidings of great joy. He didn't understand some of the King James words, especially tidings. His mother explained some of that to him, and he made it through all the rehearsals and seemed to do pretty well. But the night of the play, he stood on stage and the lights and the people, and he froze. Couldn't get it out. But then he erupted with his own version. Hey, I got good news for you. For you, for you, for you, for you. Hey. I got good news for you. It's all about the tree, and the tree is all about you. Don't miss what or who it's all about. Father, thank you so much for loving us as you do. It's beyond our most vivid imagination to think about what you were willing to do and did for us in the sending of your Son, Jesus Christ. And Father, I come this morning thanking you for a time that we can share that good news in here, and I pray that we'll share it out there. That, Father, that that we've heard we won't keep to ourselves, but we'll let others in on the greatest news ever, the greatest announcement ever. And Father... In this room this morning, maybe there's someone who's never claimed that good news as their own. And I pray in these moments that, Father, their heart might be touched and tendered to your Holy Spirit's working. And, Father, I pray that during this season that those of us who are here will invite others to be here, to be a part of our sharing of the good news. It's in the name of Jesus that we pray. Brother Kevin is going to lead us in a Christmas.